So here we are, sharing secrets of the soil with me, your host, Regen Ray. Hello, soil lovers, and welcome to another episode of Secrets of the Soil. I'm your host, Regen Ray, and today we're going to take a conversation a little bit differently than what the usual program is. We're joined by Katie. Katie, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ray. Now, you are a mum, an author, a part-time farmer, and someone who's a good caretaker of the land. You've also written a book that's all about bullying, which I think is a great testament to your caring, loving nature. So share with us all loving community a little bit about who you are. So, well, that's the, that's a pretty good summation, actually, Ray. Um, uh, so they're the things that are on my radar. But, you know, we met at a... Um, a regenerative farming uh, workshop, and that was a lot of news for me, which I really loved because I'm a newbie to farming, really, and um, <laughs> wanted to know wanted to know what uh, what I could do with our property. We've got 55 acres, and um, I want I didn't want to have any um, animal agriculture on there, but I did want to see if I could work out a way to generate income for from the property. So uh, that was really what started me thinking about re- regeneration. And we did lose, um, or we were burned out at one point a few years ago. And um, so that was a time to, you know, rethink about, you know, what I was doing with the property. And I couldn't manage it because I'm part-time, as you said, because I've got, you know, kids at school and uni and too many dogs that need walking and looking after. So, uh, for me, it was about what can I what can I do with that property to get some income and also um, uh, know that it's it can be looked after for only a, you know a few days a week because I'm only out there a few days a week. So that was really the start of the conversation. Yeah, lovely, and that was a great program. And I know that um, in that coursework and and with regenerative agriculture, one of the big pillars is the um, you know, what they refer to as like animal integration. And I know that um, having different conversations in the room and even, um, you know, during emails and other things, I'm very curious to know um, about your take on how you felt um, about that kind of animal integration. And I know in your bio, you also mentioned about how do animals play a part in this system, but they're not destined for slaughter. So I'm curious to unpack that um, and see how you, you know, comment on that and what your thoughts are and having a food system that looks a bit different than what we have today. Yeah. <laughs> I found that eight days really confronting. I have to say, right. I came home after the, after the first day, I got in my car and I thought, I need a bottle shop. I need, I need, <laughs> I need a glass of wine fast because yeah. I did find it very confronting. Just the way, well, I, essentially I'm vegan i'm a plant-based person and so the way vegans would see the world with respect to animals is that we should not be using them for animal agriculture we we cohabit the earth and we should not be exploiting them and part of the problem is that exploitation that raising animals for slaughter to eat um one it's not necessary because we can get all of the um nutrients from other sources for plant-based um we're herbivores so we've culturally we've become used to eating meat but we don't need meat in fact we weren't built to eat meat and um and i think the three three pillars that um that plant-based people will think about with respect to the earth is is that they're vegan for the animals because they we believe that it's unethical um, we we shouldn't be using them for any um, exploitation, and unfortunately, animal agriculture comes with a lot of animal cruelty. Mm. That we <clears throat> we we don't eat animals for health because um, there are many things that are contributing to demise in our population: heart disease, osteoporosis, um, mental degeneration, all contributed to by animal products. Um, so it's not very, not a very healthy, um, diet and also, uh, animal agriculture is really bad for the environment. Now you and I learned about regeneration and, you know, we learned about, you know, brittle environments and they need the animals to walk across that and 
they need masticating animals to, you know, distribute um, uh, moisture and, you know, all of those things that we learned about, which is really interesting, but we, 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 which is interesting, but it's also important for those environments, but we don't have to eat them. Mm. That's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. So even, even from a permaculture point of view, um, it's great to have animals around. Chickens are really good at scratching the earth and um, maximising aeration in veggie patches, eating bugs and grubs and those sorts of things. I've actually got four rescue animals, four rescue cows on our property, and they are doing a great job at um, chomping and pooing and, um, you know, trampling the nutrients into the soil without you know, damaging what's underneath the soil. But, um, but I don't plan to eat them. That's, that's their forever home. So, mm. um, you know, I think that you can get the benefits from all of that without um, having them destined for slaughter, I suppose, is, you know, what, what drives me. Yeah, and, and I, I, I really, you know, kudos to you for sticking out for the whole program because there was a part of me that could see your discomfort. Um, yeah, especially because of the reference of like, you know, it wasn't just like animal integration or it was like using animals as a tool, like the wording was so, um, you know, I'm not a vegan or vegetarian. I've gone down different diet pathways and experimented, but I found it kind of confronting where it was like using them as an object, you know, it's almost like you wouldn't refer to your staff on a factory as like a tool <laughs> to make the machine work, you know? And so I could see your uh, disgust in that kind of wording. And I wasn't sure if you were going to come back, to be honest. So, like, <laughs> I'm glad that you did and you stuck through it because I think there was a bit of a journey for everyone in the room. And that's why I was very curious to have this conversation. Honestly, I've been wanting to have a conversation like this with a lot of people and no one has had the um, guts, I guess, to come and talk about it. And that's why I admire that we're having this conversation today. And it's not about, you know, for me, I don't want this to get into a heated discussion or even for the soul lovers listening about what's right or wrong, but just opening up the mind to think of things differently. I'm a big believer of coins have three sides. You've got the heads, the tail and the edge, and we really need to explore the whole, you know, all three sides to really get an understanding. And I'm mindful of, you know, respecting everyone's beliefs and the way that they want to partake. But Coming from my point of view with the regenerative movement, it's very hard not to see animals in that system. And I completely agree with the fact that they need to not go to slaughter um, and, you, you know, but utilizing some of the natural, because I think a lot of the work has come from observing animals in the wild and gone, well, the animals move in big herds, yes. high impact, and, you know, they move through the grasslands and restore that, you know, vegetation. Yeah. And what's that happy medium? And I don't have the answers and I don't know if you've thought about it. I know you, you, you've you spoken a little bit about like what the future could look like when it yes. comes to farming the animals. So I'm curious to hear your vision because I feel like that's a gap in my brain at the moment. So Well, we, we, we're jumping around a lot, which is okay by me, but um, I get very, very um, worried about the environment and climate and I've got children and what sort of a future have they got? And when I look at my special interest group mm. newsletters and information, I think how, how, what about food security in 2050? Well, how, you know, yes, it's good that we're changing governments and we're now finally climate change is on their radar, but, um, you know, what we eat is one of the five areas that um, are imperative that we look at and, change to a more sustainable regime. Now, I've, I'm, you know, one of those weirdo vegans that goes to activist meetings and workshops about how I can talk to people about this sort of stuff. And one of the most fantastic, um, so two things. One is I want to talk about carnism at some point, mm -hmm. um, which is a term you might not be familiar with. But the other one is if we think about, so there's, so there's eight, nearly nine billion or there's, um, seven, nearly eight billion of us. And most of those p people have become accustomed through our food systems to eating a lot of animal product. So aside from the fact that it's not very 
very good to be having, aside from the fact that it's not very good for the animals, it's really not very kind for the planet. And so if we were to say, okay, and I got on my high horse and I said, Ray, of all of these people, there's a big pie of all the people and the tiniest sliver is vegans. And I could bang on for hours about, you know, why you should be vegan, all of that stuff. And I might, might make one more vegan, you know, the tiniest little thing. And what drives me is the animals. So making one more vegan will save maybe 250, 300 lives a year. But if I was to get a lot more of that pie to cut back, to become a reducivist, then that would be much better for the animals, much better for the humans and much better for the planet. So when I say that um, what we eat or food is one of the five drivers that we need to look at, but it's up there along with um, how we heat and cool, power, what things we build and how we travel. So they're the, you know, five things that we need to look at. So in terms of food, for me to try and change the whole world to be vegan, boy, that's a hard job. And some of that's going to have to happen because things will become more expensive. There will be politics involved. It's really confronting for farmers. Often they're, you know, generational farmers. They don't know how to do things differently. So why I was interested in going to Regen was, Okay, so what, what, and with our farm, if I'm not going to make money out of animals, how can I do that? So I think a lot about those sorts of things. So some of the stuff that's come across my desk recently that is exciting, in addition to eating less animals or not raising animals for slaughter, is that there are companies working on bio identical. So not just plastic not just substitutes, bio-identical, indistinguishable from the real milk, cheese, yogurt, egg, honey. Now, that is astounding. That is going to be a life changer because that is going to change, that will make 90, 95% less land use. No more deforestation to feed the extra 2 billion that we're going to have by 2050. Mm. Much less... Um, water use because to create a chicken, to create a, a kilo of meat or whatever, the the, the lifetime of, or well, it's a short lifetime, but the, the couple of years of um, water and grain to feed them in feedlots to make one, you know, kilo of beef is just so inefficient. It's just not sustainable. Um there's also 3D printers. There are 3D printers that are making meat. They're making facon, which is amazing. Um, and then you've also got um, substitutes. So pea proteins, soy proteins, making um, flavorful, you know, impossible burgers, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that is happening that we will see in the next not too distant future, I think, which I think is really, really exciting for the planet for human health and also for the animals. Yeah. I think you make a really good point in regards to the fact that we just need to consume less in all fronts. It's not just about meat, but it's also in vegetables and, and all food because so much is going to waste. Oh, so moving the gases. It around, yes, I know. Moving it around mm. the country um, or the world um, when maybe we can just consume less, like the whole research of having to graze and eat six meals a day and, you know, this and that, like, I feel like a lot of those paradigms are shifting and a lot of those were funded by food industries who were motivated to, you know, encourage us to eat more um, of whatever type of food group it is. And I think you make a great point in regards to, you know, converting everyone or making everyone see that veganism is the future isn't impossible. And I think in all accounts, but really educating everyone to consume less, doesn't matter what diet you're on, mm. just eating less can be very, very beneficial or buying food that is more nutrient dense. So that way you are getting the nutrients fixed that your body and your health needs because it's grown regeneratively org organic and with, you know, more conscious. So and locally. And locally, that's right, because yeah. of the local biodiversity uh, that, that we need. Um, yeah. I want to chat about carnism later, but yep. while we're on this topic, how do you, how do you, 
feel about the demand on, say, soy and grains and the number of farmers that are moving to, say, monoculture that is then also causing, say, biological collapse in those communities because of the big, you know, again, I think consuming less helps this problem, but I'm interested to hear your view on the number of farmers that are abandoning their current farm practices and going to, like, soy or other products that are used in plant-based meats. Yeah. Um, that then is causing biological collapse because chemicals spraying yeah. and no biodiversity. Yeah. Yeah. So Terrible. What, I know. Yeah. So and, that's where I get torn between these kind of two ideologies. And they're still, they're still using tilling techniques, rip it all out, start again every year yep. and then, and then fertilize just, I know it's terrible. Um, so, but what I would say for that is that most of the soy and the grain that they're growing is to feed beef. Yeah. Yes. So, so that's where the inefficiencies are, and that's you know that's why they're going there. But you know some of the some of the information and the videos that I've seen about these massive farms, particularly in America, because a lot of the research comes out of there. I'm, I'm sure that Australia is not dissimilar. But when you see these massive um, tracts of land, but they but they, they, there's a tipping point. After a few years, all of a sudden they've depleted too much and the soil just cannot regenerate. It cannot come good and it cannot produce the crops that they want. So they're fertilising more. And that cycle is just downward, only downward. And I feel for those farmers um, because often they're, they're seeing, you know, they're trying to move with the with you know what's changing. They're trying to take what they've inherited from grandpa and great grandpa and uh, some of those things, but they are on the wrong path and the wrong path for soil um, and the wrong path for sustainability. Mm. I, don't, I don't know how how we talk to them. There are some great guys. Um, I'm not sure if I've heard them on your podcast. I've heard them on other podcasts. A bit of a podcast binger. Um, there's a great guy that's. Um, uh, in America that has got, you know, this working model of how he's changed his business around and in not that, not that long a time. And I love those stories. Mm. Do you know the name or? Uh, I will find out that name. Yeah, no worries. Awesome. Yeah. Cause I, I, you know, people need to see, to believe, you know, we talk about facts and figures and research. You can't see it. You can't be it. You know, I agree. And, oh. um, and, and so that's why I'm very interested to just explore all these different sides of this narrative because I see so much toxicity in Facebook groups where people are arguing together rather yeah. than how do we just talk about this and have an open conversation so yeah. we can see each other's point of views. And that's what I really wanted to encourage with this podcast. And I want everyone, like I know that, you know, some people say, no, there's a right and wrong, but I think that kind of, you know, right and wrong or like a winner and loser doesn't help us move the narrative forward. And I'd much no. rather have an open discussion that makes someone just go, yeah, I never thought of it that way. And yeah, yeah. I can really see that point and not make an overnight cold turkey decision, you know? So I don't think it ever is though, Ray. And yeah. what's interesting, see, I wasn't born vegan. Mm. In fact, most of my life was, well, no, I'm a lot older than I think. But um, so, so it really wasn't until, like I was mindful. I loved animals. I grew up with animals. Um, I just, I think that we just disconnected from domestic farm animals and wild animals. We just, we were so busy. I just don't even think we make the connection of, of what we buy in the supermarket with, you know, that's actually a living, thinking, emotional being. And we just disconnected from where our food comes from. Um, it's just too convenient. It just appears there. And, and that attitude is not sustainable, mm. whether we're talking about, you know, vegetables or whether we're, you know, talking about um, animals. So, um I, you know, I think, but I think the time has come. I think people are starting to listen. And, um, and I think that um, if you, it is emotive, I get that. But if we can suspend, suspend judgment, and I did it for eight days. So if I can do it, anyone can. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's, it's really important because I think veganism and plant-based thinking is about sowing a seed, which is ironic. Mm -hmm. And then that gets watered with time. So I actually, as I said, I wasn't, I wasn't born a vegan, but when I think I was just watching the television when my kids were young and there was, I didn't eat a lot of meat and I didn't eat some meat. I wouldn't eat babies, for example, which is just hypocritical, but that was my thinking. And I'd heard that the Dalai Lama said, you know, if you, um, if the, the animals already been killed, 
um, if he was served accidentally, then he, he would eat that animal. So I'd go out with friends and they'd say, you're going to do a Dalai Lama tonight. So that was part of my process. And then I realised that is just hypocritical and looked in the mirror. But what happened was I actually saw um, an advertisement from Animals Australia. It was this little flying pig. I thought, well, that's interesting. That's kind of cute. So I actually Googled them and they just had this little video, a few minutes, about factory farming. And that opened up my mind. I thought, well, this is crazy. If this is true, wow, that this is this is this is confronting and it's disturbing. And then for someone like me, the more I learned, because I was curious, the more videos I thought uh, that I saw, the more information that I gained, I thought, no, this is this industry is mean and, and I don't want to be a part of it. So it, I think my point is that, that you know, maybe that realisation comes with time and some people need carrots and some people need sticks. And as I said, in time, it will become apparent that we can no, we can no longer eat as many animal products as we used to. Subsidies will dry up, I think, because politicians will be torn about investing in renewable energy as opposed to subsidies, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's happening with the oil companies as well. Those mm -hmm. subsidies will dry up because we've got to renew, you know, invest in renewables. So you know, the world is changing. My husband, you know, I jump up and down and get all emotional and and he says, darling, just relax. The world is changing, not fast enough for you, but we are all learning at a different speed depending on what else is on our radar. So, you know, I get it. And I celebrate you for being open to that conversation, Ray. Mm. Katie, thank you so much for being so open and honest about that. So, lovers, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, I'm really keen to know what this carnism word is all about. So stick with us. Wait, before you hit the skip button, if you're a soil lover and love listening to my podcast then i want you to discover more by getting access to my patreon where i share behind the scenes and bonus content that doesn't always make the conversations on the podcast so head over to secretsofthesoil.com slash support where for a very small fee you get to hang out with me and other soil lovers where we get to geek out about soil and get access to exclusive content it's very exclusive. No, not really. It's just a lot of fun and a way that we get to support this podcast together in order so that we can have deeper conversations all about soil from mentors all around the world. So what are you waiting for? Go on, show your support and token appreciation for this podcast. Until next time, well, I'll let you get back to the show. Cheers. Welcome back, soil lovers. You're hanging out with Regen Ray and Katie. We're going to talk about Carnism. This is a new word for me. Can you shed some light what this <laughs> word is? I love learning new things. <laughs> so, so carnism is about describing the, the um, why, why do we um, wear cows, um, eat pigs and love dogs? Why, why, what is it about some animals that we love and some animals that we don't love enough to say? What, what is it? It's, and it's an invisible filter with, um, that we've that we've learned. It's a learned attitude about some animals that that's acceptable to eat and others are not, and um, and it, we're not born with it. So a lot of um, vegans or plant based thinkers will say, we you know if you put a, um, a baby in a cot with an apple and a bunny, they're going to love the bunny and eat the apple. Um, we you know we 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 born with empathy. We love animals. They entertain us. They they're charming. Uh, what is, how is it that that's changed so that, you know, some people are eating meat or eating animal products three times a day. And so carnism is just the description of that, that um, filter, that, that mindset that makes it okay to turn a blind eye to some animals and what they have to live through to get to our plate and then um, embrace other animals. That's what mm -hmm. that's about. That is very interesting. And I love that. I've just learned that. And it reminds me of a couple of like prank YouTube videos that I've seen in the past where um, uh, people are in a shopping mall handing out samples of milk and then people are drinking it and they go, oh, what type of milk is that? And they say, oh, it's human breast milk. And they yeah. spit it out and they discuss. And if anything doesn't make more sense than that is like why we would drink another animal's milk, but not our own human milk. And yeah. that people are disgusted by that idea. And um, yeah, I just think that's um, very- would you, would you drink giraffe milk or elephant milk? 
Yeah, yeah. And, well, and you know, plant-based people would say, well, you know, once once mammals have weaned, once babies have weaned, yeah. there's no other animal that drinks milk, someone else's milk, but milk past that weaning stage. Yeah. But I think, you know, uh, this is another thing to that carnism and industries kind of feed into that you that we're not really told the truth about where our food comes from mm. in terms of um uh you know practices that that are performed on animals in farms uh, would be illegal on domestic animals and particularly for dairy which is a very cruel industry where Um, cows make milk because they're babies, they're they're mothers, and that's to feed their babies. But the the dairy industry takes the babies away to keep the milk. And um, I don't think a lot of people have really even made that connection because when you make that connection, you go, well, that's really mean. So, um, you know, but people go, oh, geez. But the good news is for uh, people who are looking at plant-based eating or decreasing animal um, products and increasing plant-based products is that now is the time to do it because there are so many amazing products out there um, that uh, replicate that you, you're not missing out on anything really. You're not, you know, there are cheeses, there are milks, there are plant proteins. And as I said, when this, um, you know, I suppose it's not all just test tube, but when this bio-identical um, proteins and milks and things are made, there will be absolutely no difference. Mm. So it will be a lot easier for people to just um, switch. Yeah. And I think you're very, very right. I move into Sydney, get to spend some time in Newtown. And it's a very good corridor for a lot of vegan restaurants. And you wouldn't even tell the difference. Like yeah. I can be testament that I've had meals and I can't believe it's not me, you know, like, yeah. it's say like that, that to my friends who are eating it. And, and I met a, um, a cheese maker who makes vegan cheeses. And he started yeah. talking about, you know, he, the amount of effort that he puts into, f- you know, ferment cheeses and things like that made out of nuts and different yeah. ingredients. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, he's, he's mastered a ricotta that most people couldn't tell in a blind yeah. test, whether it yeah. wasn't and isn't. And the passion that came from, him explaining it just made me realize that there are a lot of people and this is you know this is not, like because i'm not sure if i'm ready personally for this bio 3d printed food uh even though i'm excited by tech or like lab grown but the fact that there are alternatives from technology and materials that we already have available right now is yeah. is very, very fascinating yeah. um and and you know you're quite right people are disconnected i remember a, a restaurant uh putting pictures of uh, the, 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 the cows on the menu and so forth. And people yeah. would leave in disgust. Yes. And it's like, well, but that's the reality of what you're eating. Why that's can carnism. I? Yeah, that's, that's carnism. That's, yeah. That's, and that's what reminded me as you're speaking, it's like yeah. put the real animal there. You have a problem with it. Put yeah. a cartoon or that it's grass fed from the neighbors down the road. And I'm yeah. all for food province and the story behind it. And you're okay. There is that filter or that, blockage that happens when we don't see or name it have that activity Um, i totally understand i totally understand and as i said that was me for a large part of my life Mm. so i get i get it yeah and and i share that story for soil lovers to join those dots and and see that there are real life examples of where people have tried to put you know the the farmer's cattle on their menu and people have an issue with it and we need to not say that's wrong yeah. Right, but why is that the case? And yeah. you know, big media and big food companies are pushing this narrative. I, I want to know your thoughts on the whole point of fake milk and fake meat, because I don't like referring to it as fake meat. I rather refer it as plant meat based. Do you think calling things fake meat still keeps the narrative that there needs to be meat in the narrative? Or like, what's your take on this whole fake meat? And do you think that the word fake puts a negative connotation to the movement? Um, I do. I don't like the word fake. I use alternative. Mm. Um, I, you know, I think it's a bit like, um, I think, you know, there, there's a lot of, there's a bit of stuff around, you know, when there was champagne, you're not allowed to call it champagne because that's actually a province of, of yeah. France. Mm. So it's a, it's a bit like, you know, it'll, uh, some, of the, some of the dairy companies are not happy about um, plant-based milk being called um well, you know, dairy farmers aren't happy about it being called milk or cheese, but, you know, effectively it is. Um, so I wouldn't call it fake because I think it's a bit of a negative 
um, story. But I would say alternative, and I do. I don't think that it's about. Um, I don't think it's about replacing meat with an alternative. I think it is a different way of looking at cooking food. Um, you, do, you don't have to have meat and cheese substitutes at every meal either. And I don't think a lot of plant-based people do that. But I do think for people who are wanting a healthier lifestyle, who are conscious of the planet, who are conscious of perhaps decreasing animal suffering, then an alternative is a good way of doing that reducivism that I was talking about. So mm. there's these fantastic schnitzels that I can get. You know, you, you might have schnitzel night or you might have taco night and there's no reason why you can't use lentils instead of mints, you know, that kind of thing. So there are great recipes, great recipe books, uh, and there's great resources so that you can, um, you can actually make that transition little by little. So I wouldn't call them fake, but I would say they're alternative. And sometimes I don't even say what they are. I just say that's cheese when I'm going out or I'll just say these are chicken sandwiches that I've made or cucumber sandwiches or I've bought a cheese platter. I don't say these are fake cheeses or this is a cashew cheese. People say, oh, that's yummy. What's that? And I'll say, well, that's a macadamia cheese or that's a cashew cheese or, you know, that's an ash rolled, you know, whatever it is. So um, I don't think you even need to. Mm. And I, I love telling people at the end, you know, that was, or if people find out later, they say, oh, this is great, you know, and they, but I didn't think you you cooked meat. I said, I don't. There's nothing, everything here is is vegan or plant, you know, plant-based. It's, Oh, really? Yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, that's, and I like to have a positive um, experience with that. I, 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 so I would only recommend something that I thought was really good because I want people to have a positive experience because that's going to water that seed that we we're talking about before. Yeah, I definitely, and I think there's been a lot of that now where there are a lot of positive. I know the first time I tried, tried oat milk, it was at a coffee conference in Melbourne showing my true identity. And I could not <laughs> believe this wasn't real milk, like, or not real milk, like it wasn't milk. Like I could not taste the difference. And I hands down would say that if there's an alternative milk, um, I find oat milk. And then, you know, everyone starts doing the calculations of like, well, it's 80% water and it should it be called milk? And they get stuck in all the detail. And do you know how much, you know, energy is taken to process that oat into, into a, you know, milk. And it's like, but you again are not looking at this other side of the coin of how, in, you know, like what you said before, so much of the grain that is grown in monoculture yeah. is moved to the, um, to just to be supplement. It's something food. like 60 or 80%. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. You know, it's crazy. It's the same with, you know, they, they feed a lot of the, um, or they, uh, um, give a lot of the animals in feedlots, particularly antibiotics. Yeah. So most of them, and chickens, a lot of them are antibiotics because they're kept in such cramped environments that they develop bugs and diseases and all that kind of stuff. So they think, okay, so prophylactically we'll just give them antibiotics, but that just means that in the future we're going to have these massive superbugs because, you know, the, the whole, a lot of the population of animals, you know, human animals as well on the, on the um, planet um, have built up a resistance. So um, all the bugs have built up a resistance yeah. and, the, you know, we've been using too many antibiotics. So, you know, all of those things feed into my... And then they once once I'm in that space, it's easy for me to be vegan and plant based because I don't feel like I'm giving anything up. I can only see positives, you know. So for for me, it's sustainable. Mm. What what was something that really blew your mind when you went through this? So how long have you been, you know, because you said you weren't always like this. So how long? And what was something that really blew your mind when you discovered this whole veganism and 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 movement? Um. So. Um, I think, so I've been vegan for about 12 years yeah. and fully vegan. Before that, I would eat fish. I didn't eat much meat and cheese and I've always, and for the last 20 years, I think I've had soy milk. So, um, so, you know, that's kind of, that was kind of my story, but I think it was the truth about what happens in animal agriculture. I think that was the turning point for me. I just thought, wow, that, that's cruel. That's not right. That's mean. And I don't want to be graphic on your podcast because I understand that that can be really confronting for people. But dairy in particular, I think there's more cruelty in a glass of milk than there is in, a, you know, a steak. Mm. So when you learn that that's okay and that, and and welfare practices are actually, um, uh, you know, itemised and you think, well, hang on, how, how can that be right? for a farm animal and not for a domestic animal. That, like, that doesn't seem to be fair to me. So 
Um, you know, those sorts of things, I think. And I just thought to myself, I'm an idiot. How, how did I not even connect the dots? How did I think that it was going to be okay that, you know, you, you, that what comes in in a plastic packet on a, you know, one of those polystyrene trays is not connected to a somebody in a paddock somewhere? So I was actually a bit shocked and disappointed in myself, really. But I think it's part of the, you know, system, quote, unquote, to create this kind of naiveness to where all food comes from. You know, we're not just the whole nutritional value. Like I've been spending a lot of time around people, you know, that whole saying an apple a day keeps a doctor away. Well, yeah. now you need like four apples a day to get the same nutritional value. <laughs> and we don't even yes. eat we don't even eat the apple, which is juicing and have all the fructose and not the fiber. <laughs> you know, so it's such a broken system. And we're told yeah. that we're doing it healthy because we're using a juice, you know, diet or we're having a juice instead of uh, a, a cheeseburger. But, you, you know, like it's, it's just blows my mind. And it is that kind of, I feel like it's a purposeful movement where we are trained in a certain way when we're at school and we see things on TV and. Yes. The they're happy cows, they have pictures of happy animals you know, chirping away. But can I just say that the food group, that whole thing that we were taught at school, that is changing. Mm. So that, that is changing slowly. Um, and, in fact, the World Health Organisation has actually classified meat as a carcinogen. So, you know, slowly things will filter down, I think, and that, you know, future generations will, will be able to make uh, choices based on more information rather than mm. what we had, which was less. I really hope so, though, because, you know, you look at the whole smoking industry and it's still a multi-billion dollar, trillion dollar probably industry and it's labels on the can, it's poisonous, it's toxic, yeah. and yet people are still leaning on it and use it as a vice. Yeah. That's addiction. You know, and I just think how, yeah, you know, sometimes more information just makes people go, yep, well, I know that it's dangerous for me. And then they turn but I'm going to do it anyway. You know, yeah. it's my life and whatnot. Hey, do you know what I le learned this morning? That mm -hmm. there is a compound in milk so what so one of the hardest things for people to give up is cheese they go oh but cheese but apparently there's a something morphine like an endomorphine or something that is in cheese that is quite addictive wow. so um i totally um get what you're saying that people just get set in their ways with things and then they just think too much information i just mm. i'm just gonna you know stick with what i know Mm. I think it's crazy too, that we live in a world where you pay a premium for having no poisons put into our food which yes. is the other way around. It's like, <laughs> there is more additives in this. There's more work being done and yet it costs it's less. It's bad for the planet. Fertilizers yeah. and all of that. Agree. Agree. Yeah. Katie, it's been awesome chatting to you. Is there any other things that you wanted to share with our soul lovers community and even myself? Cause I'm on this learning exploration as well. Um, anything you want to really get off, you know, your chest and, and share with the world. Um, what would that be? I think it's borrowing from Edgar's Mission, which is a, um, a rescue and animal rescue facility here in Melbourne. Uh, and that is if we could lead happy, healthy lives without harming anyone, why wouldn't we? Mm, I love that thought. I love that thought. So that's your, th your, th your thought, but now we're going to switch gears. And obviously this is a podcast about soil and I know that you're a farmer and someone yes. who's for nature and, and so forth. But if you could become the voice of the soil, what would you tell us on planet Earth? I think I would say that to just to tread kindly and carefully and to respect the fact that this planet has been evolving, the ecosystems, the biology, the biodiversity has been developed and cohabiting for centuries, for millennia. Respect that. Things are there for a reason. They feed into each other. Otherwise, they would have been evolved out. So just be mindful that there is a greater wisdom out there than possibly we know. Damn, I just got goosebumps. Ooh, <laughs> that, was, that was deep. I love that <laughs> tread lighter and that there's a greater wisdom out there. And I just, you know, I think that is just so uh, powerful because, you know, we have intervened a system that has worked for millennia and yeah. thinking that we can outsmart it and we can yield bigger and better and use all these chemicals and machinery and um, I think we're now starting to see that tipping point where systems are failing. We are having to go through major change. Um, there's a lot of uh, pressure on citizens to do something 
Uh, and, you know, I think it is our own sovereignty to, that we need to bring it into our own domain to listen to podcasts like this and educate ourselves and go on YouTube and look at the harsh images if you need to um, see the coin from all different sides because that whole mentality of, well, if it was bad, the governments would have banned it or someone else out externally would have put regulations around it. And we've just seen way too many times that yeah. that doesn't happen. Yeah. And when you do follow that, you realise, oh, there's a money trail. Yeah. Oh, all the people profiting. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Well, Katie, how can the soul lovers hang out with you more? And I know you've got a book and it's a little bit of a different topic, but I think it's very true to your caring nature and it is about bullying in, in schools. And I want to give you the opportunity to give that a bit of a shout out. Oh, thanks Ray. Well, um, I am available. Uh, I've got a website, katieflanagan.com.au. And um, you can probably search me on most things, Twitter and Instagram and those sorts of things. I don't, I don't um, um, post much about um, soil. I do post a bit about the farm and definitely a lot about my dogs um, and not very much about veganism because it can tend to polarise people. But uh, if you do follow me, you might find my rescue cows who are very happy and very fat. <laughs> Love that. And all those links will be around uh, the, the show notes and... Um... And yeah, and I, know, I just want to thank you for uh, making the conversation. And uh, do you mind sharing how this conversation come up? Like, are you, are you okay if I share it? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as um, part of our Farming Secrets business, when someone leaves our marketing list, I get a report and I saw that Katie's name unsubscribed and I'm usually curious. And I was like, hey, why did you unsubscribe? I'm, you know, was it a mistake or did it hard bounce? And you came back and said, you know, seeing the amount of animal integration and the use of animals in regenerative farming is hard to see sometimes. And so, you know, that then piqued my interest to say, can we have a discussion about it? And so I just want to share with everyone about how these conversations sometimes come up. Uh, they're very organic, they're very natural, and it's just us really wanting to um, create content that is meaningful and, and opens up different views. And so I didn't know whether you would say yes. And so I'm very grateful that you did. And you had, you know, not many people respond to that email. So, you know, I think the universe was aligning us to have this conversation. And like you said, if one person changes, and I'll be honest, even myself during this conversation, I've sat here thinking about my values and where they lie. Yeah. So thanks, Ray. I thought it was took a lot of courage for you to say, well, come on the show because you weren't sure what to expect. And um, I, I just wanted to get back to you about that email because I didn't, you said, oh, is it something we've done or something we need to improve? And that's why I was just saying to you, no, it's not. You, you know, what you're doing is amazing. And I love that. It's just that some of those things I can find a bit triggering. Mm. And I'm the same, you know, I think all systems, we need to take pressure off everything, the road mm. systems, the transport systems, you know, the schooling system, everything, you know, there's just so much pressure that everyone wants it done for them. They want convenience. Um, you know, the amount of produce, like we've got so many shortages happening at the moment and no one's sitting there I going, know. can I consume less? Like no one's thinking that they're going, why the shelves? Where am I going to get it? Yeah. Why am I going to pay, you know, $20 a head of lettuce somewhere? Yeah. You know, like why? Like, you know, um, so there are a lot of systems that are at, you know, I wouldn't say collapse. I think change. You know what's exciting. coming. You know what's coming. And this is really exciting. Food jungles. Oh, Yeah. So, so in the future, there will be, there will, why do we have nature strips and front lawns? I agree. Why is that not a food jungle? There's our lettuce. There's our, and if we've got too much, what's happened? We'll swap it with the neighbours. We've got a beautiful neighbour and they use every single inch of that. And they're forever saying, do you want lemons? What can we swap? So I have to, you know, make up some caramelised balsamic or some chutney so we can swap. So, um, yeah, food jungles are coming. That's going to be fun too. Yeah, food jungles, food forests, I think they are an amazing abundance um, and I'm seeing a lot of that already happening and I agree. I think, you know, I um, it's just a shame that we need to get systems to the point of, you know, um, the yes. brink. Yeah. People wake up and go, well, maybe I need to learn how to grow my own food. I grew up in that culture. My grandparents grew their own food in the backyard, that whole permaculture. Yes. Uh, sorry, I remember retro, retro yeah. suburbia um, yeah. movement is kind of my childhood, you know. And so, so you get it. Yeah. But, but most of people living in cities don't understand farming, don't understand what goes on, that it's 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And if you have a bad season, that's income. You know, I think they're just disconnected. I think it, it, it comes to the supermarket and we don't have it this week. Why not? 
Yeah, and seasonality. Like we're not meant to have avocados all year round. We're not meant to have watermelons all year round. You know, things are meant to be in season and they grow with more nutrient density when they're grown in their proper season, you know. So, yes. um, You know, so love that. Well, Katie, been awesome chatting. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, Thank you for having me. Learned a bucket load and um, going to sit here and quietly reflect after the show about my, <laughs> my, my views. I can't say I'm going to go cold turkey, but I definitely think you make a valid point in regards to reduction and, um, and, uh, and, and, and just being more of a conscious consumer, knowing where things come from and what that empathy um, has attached to it as well. Thanks, Ray. Thanks for listening. Awesome. Well, soul lovers, there you go. There's another episode for you. Uh, Until next time, make sure that you're getting outside, getting your hands dirty, digging deeper into our wonderful world of soils. And as Katie said, make sure that you're treading lightly. Hello, soil lovers. I hope you're enjoying today's guest and this podcast, but I wanted to just let you know that when you get excited about soil, just as you're hearing about our guests, then you will want to check out the Soil Learning Centre. The Soil Learning Centre is a hub that we put together and digitalized all the content over the years that were originally on DVD into this online learning experience. So if any of our guests or any of the topics that we speak about during the podcast whet your appetite and you want to get your hands dirtier and dig deeper and get educated around different things around soil, whether it be biodynamics, permaculture, whether it be using a microscope, or whether it just be hanging out with other like-minded educators, mentors, and facilitators, then the Soil Learning Centre is a place for you to hang out and dig deeper. That's the soillearningcentre.com. We have lots of different programs, courses, and even a membership. So if you want to belong to a community of other soil lovers, then that's the place to hang out. Well, until we meet again, enjoy the rest of this podcast. Back to the program. Well, soil lovers, that's enough secrets for one episode. I really hope that you enjoyed all the secrets shared during this conversation. But hey, let's not keep it a secret. Please share this podcast around and make sure that you like it and leave us a review because that really helps spread the secrets of the soil. Until next time, remember, get outside, get your hands dirty and keep digging deeper into your soils.